So um, today we'll talk, I'm going to be talking a little bit about representation and reasoning for intelligent tutoring beyond problem solving. And I had some slides about intelligent tutoring systems, but then I realized that we don't need them because there has been already, you know, like the speakers have already talked about intelligent tutoring systems in general. And we have seen that there have been successful initiatives in devising intelligent tutoring systems in the last 20 years or so. It's true that we're not as far ahead as we thought we would be, as we would like to be, but it's also there is evidence that tutoring the to intelligent tutoring system technology can provide successful and uh, reliable um, support to education, okay? And uh, for instance, we've talked about uh, the tutors developed at Carnegie Learning and uh, Bev in her uh, great textbook has some other discussion of some other important examples. Uh, however, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the success stories in intelligent tutoring systems are for systems that provide personalized support to problem-solving activities. That is, activities that are characterized by the fact that we do have a clear definition of correctness for the answers or solutions that we're looking for, and they can be leveraged to provide feedback to students when they interact with the system. And often there are well-defined solutions to the problems that the students are given. And again, so the solutions can be represented in the domain model and are given to the tutor so that the tutor can even provide scaffolding and support for students to generate the solutions. And we have seen some examples. Um, and you know, this is great because problem solving is, of course, a very important part of pedagogy and of learning. However, um, there are other forms of instructions that can be very useful for learning for different types of learners or even for the same learner at different stages at, you know, during the learning process. Um, and we've, you know, we've seen that there are people who are now working on uh, more like exploratory types of uh, interactions, uh, um, working with systems that can promote metacognition. In particular, in my group, we have been looking at activities that go from instance, uh, for instance, from learning from examples, so things that come before problem solving, how you study examples in an effective manner so that you can then use that information to go into problem solving. Playing with educational games, these famous educational games that do they work, they don't work, we don't know, but you know, we have been trying to see what we can do in order to make educational games more effective and also learning via exploration of interactive simulations. Okay, so these are all activities that can be complementary to problem solving in some sort of a learning path. Uh, and today I will focus on uh, exploring interactive simulations. So some of the concept, concepts can generalize to these other activities that I've been talking about. Um, and, you know, one important aspect of, so, there's been quite a lot of excitement for interactive simulations because they tend, first of all, to allow learners to explore a domain, to be more in charge of the learning process by exploring what the simulation, the activities and the phenomena that the simulation provides. And in general, they can help the learner deepen their conceptual understanding by working on concrete examples, okay? Uh, and these days there's been a lot of excitement for interactive simulations because they're seen as being, for instance, a good complement to self-directed study, to MOOCs, for instance, and for these other long, you know, um, e-learning based activities. Uh, this is just an example of a huge initiative at University of Colorado in Boulder. It's called FEL, FET Interactive Simulation Project. They're, they're focusing on physics and they're developing I would say dozens, they're getting to you know, hundreds of simulations all in the domain of physics. They're you know, freely available. You can go on their website, download them, give them to your students. There is a little bit of freedom for the teacher to customize them, to make them fit into their curriculum. They go on and on. This is another example. Uh, this is a smaller suite of uh, interactive simulations. They have been uh, developed in our department. These are simulations that we have devised, so the AI group in our department has devised to help students understand AI algorithms. So it's called AI space. There is a, a variety of tools for you know, understanding search algorithms, constraint satisfaction, Bayesian networks, uh, 
neural networks, decision trees, and so on and so forth. If we, are, we use them regularly in our AI courses, we use them during lectures to illustrate some of the concepts, and then we give them to students at home to work with them and just explore some of the ideas that we introduce in class. If you want to use them, you can Google AI space and you know, they're free to use. Um, so today, I'm going to show you an ex one example for you know, the sake of time. This is uh, one of these uh, simulations. It's called the CSP applet. CSP stands for Constraint Satisfaction Problems. And this is particularly designed to visualize the workings of one specific algorithm for constraint satisfaction. It's called the AC3 algorithm. And this algorithm, what it essentially does, a constraint satisfaction problem is represented as a graph where the variables the nodes are the variables that are involved in the constraint satisfaction problem. The arcs represent the constraint. And what this algorithm does goes through all the variables and prunes values of the domains that are not consistent with the constraints. Okay? We're just going to show you a little demo here. The mechanisms are accessible through the toolbar or through the direct manipulation of graph elements. Users can perform seven different actions. The find step button can be used to see how AC3 goes through its three basic steps. Selecting an arc, testing it for consistency, and removing domain values to make the arc consistent. Users can directly click on an arc to apply all these steps at once or automatically find step on all arcs one by one by using the auto arc consistency action. If desired, the stop button will pause auto arc consistency. At the end of auto arc consistency, if there remains a variable with more than one domain value, a procedure called domain splitting can be applied to that variable to split the CSP into disjoint cases so that AC3 can recursively solve each case. The user can select which variable and value to split on by selecting that variable. For example, in this case, 3 is selected for A. The message panel situated below the graph reports the domain splits made by the user. Users can recover alternative sub networks during domain splitting with the backtrack button. Now, a new CSP where A equals 4 is generated for solving. Finally, the reset button resets the problem to its initial state. Okay, so this is give you a sense of the fact that there are several actions, that there are several problems already loaded into this simulation. The student can select them at will, and they can play with the different actions that are available to try to explore and understand how AC3 algorithm works, okay? But the main point here is that there is no right or wrong. The student can do whatever she feels is useful for her to understand AC3 using these tools. So that's the idea, okay? So, um, and you know, we've used this a lot. We've designed it. Uh, we went through a lot of it, you know, the iterative design and the evaluation process to find the best way to design the simulation so that students can use them easily and so on and so forth. We have results showing, we've done formal studies, and we have seen that what others have found. Some students work really well and learn from the simulations, others not so much. And this goes back to the point that Ton was making yesterday, one size fits all doesn't work that well, okay? So um, some students, for instance, are not as good as self-monitoring or structuring their work, so they kind of get lost. They work with all these tools, but they don't really absorb what matters, okay? So what we believe is that it's really important to try to you know, change this uh, one-size-fits-all to a situation in which it is possible to provide support to those students that need it, and again, it's not all of them, but some of them do, provide support um, you know, based on their observed needs. The problem here is because the interaction is more, it's unstructured, and we do not have this very, you know, definition of correctness, we don't have this very well-defined behaviors, how do we model what the student should do, and also 
if this, you know, even if we find out how to model that, how do we provide adaptive support that fosters learning and a successful interaction with the simulation, but still maintains the nature of the interaction, which is the one, one in which the student has the initiative and the student is you know, a prime actor in deciding what to do, okay? So we don't want to kill that part by making it too, too pedagogical, too tutorial, okay? So I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, we're going to start with how to model what the students should do. And, uh, so, and the problem, again, just to re reiterate, is that the activities are more open-ended and less well-defined than, than pure problem-solving activities. We don't have a, definition, a priori definition of what is correct behaviors, that it's good in the simulations, or what is effective behavior. Um, so how it's hard to model a priori the necessary student behaviors and related skills, okay? We have tried with a different simulation, and if there is time later on, I can discuss that, okay? That you can have a knowledge-based approach. It's usually very painful, time-consuming, and uh, there are other issues, okay? So now we try with a different approach that is more based on data, okay? So we build our models and the subsequent hints that we want to provide to the learners based on what the model says, based on behaviors that are discovered by a data mining. Okay? So, for the rest of the talk, what I will do, I will uh, first discuss how we do behavior discovery by data mining. Then I'll describe how we, do, we use that information to build student models that can classify learners as they interact with the simulation, as you know, learning well or not, or needing help. And then how we also use this behavioral discovery to automatically build adaptive support during the interaction. I will do it first for the CSP applet. And then, I, if there is time, I'll also discuss an application to a totally different simulation to see that the approach transfers, okay? It's not just used in this particular simulation. All right, so behavioral discovery by data mining. I'm just gonna stay obvious at the, at the high level in the interest of time, but essentially what we wanna do is wanna collect interaction events from students working with the simulation of interest. You start with action logs. You could try other data, and if there is time, I'll talk a little bit about what we did with gaze data, but for now, let's just stay action logs. From these uh, uh, interaction events, one can build a vector of uh, interaction features that essentially represent how a user interacts with, has been interacting with the simulation up to a certain point. For instance, you could, you know, some of the features could be frequency of usage of each of the available interface actions, uh, latency in between actions, and so on and so forth, okay? Once we have these vectors, we just use some standard data mining techniques such as clustering to try to find groups of users that are working in similar manners with the, with the simulation, okay? Clusters give you the, gr the clusters give groups, but they usually don't say much about why certain, you know, what are the behaviors that makes users be in certain groups. So there are other techniques that can be used from data mining, such as association rule mining, and these are techniques that are able to extract from a cluster what are the relationships that identify the membership to that cluster, okay? So in this particular case, they struck what are the distinguishing patterns for each specific cluster. And I'll give you some examples, okay? Um, once we have this cluster, we can try to see how they relate to learning, okay? We can give the clusters to experts that so might look at the behaviors in there, at the rules, for instance, and say, well, this seems to be something that belongs to a, a someone who is working well with the interaction, with the, with the simulation. Or I will show you for evaluation purposes, if you collect learning data pre and post test, you can use that to see if these clusters correspond to different levels of learning, okay? So I'm going to give you an example of how this works on the CSP applet that I showed you earlier. So we ran a study where we had 64 students, AI students that were kind of ready to take the AI course. And they studied a textbook with material on this AC3 algorithm. They took a pretest on their understanding of the algorithm. Then we gave them two examples, two problems to explore using the simulation and then they took a post-test, okay? 
So we collected about you know, 13,000 actions and more than 17 hours of interaction. Um, and in this particular case, for the, the feature vectors, we're based on uh, features related to, as I said earlier, frequency of usage for each of the actions in the interface and pause duration between actions, both mean and standard deviations. Standard deviation gives you how regular they are in their behavior, okay? And pause in between actions, essentially we take it as a rough measure of whether they're thinking about what they're doing. Because if they just jump around and do a lot of actions without stopping, then most likely they're just playing around, okay? Um, so, because we have seven actions with these particular measures, we have 21 features, so each student is defined by these 21 features. When we do clustering, uh, the paper has details on how the, you know, what kind of clustering we do, but no, it's not that important here, but we found two clusters, okay? And if we look at a measure of learning, in this case we looked at uh, um, learning gains, percentage learning gains, that is defined by the post-test score of the student minus the pre-test uh, divided by the maximum possible pre-test score minus uh, the pre-test. And this percentage learning gain, by using this measure, we found in these two clusters, there, were, there was a statistically significant difference in this measure, showing that one cluster kind of corresponded to students can, can learn better with the, with the simulation than students in the other clusters. So, okay, we'll call them high and low learners from now on. Um, for the purpose of this presentation. So once we have the clusters, we want to see what are the behaviors that identify the students, okay? So we apply this uh, um, behavior discovery, this associational rule mining, and I'm going to give you here a couple of examples of rules. These are not the only ones that were found, but for instance, for the high learner cluster, don't look at this uh, representation, it's a bit cumbersome, but this translates into the fact that one behavior that was seen as being representative of high learners was that they use direct art cl click very frequently. Direct art click is when you choose which arc the, the AC3 algorithm checks. You don't let the algorithm choose. You can choose, choose it yourself, okay? Uh, and high learners do it more, do it more frequently, which is an indication that they could, might be a little bit more proactive in working with the system because they take the initiative of choosing the arc, okay? Another rule that was discovered was that students in the low learner uh, group use direct arc click more sparsely, so the opposite behavior of this one, but, and when they do it, they tend to have short pauses in between the direct or click actions or in the following action, okay? So they seem to do it, but maybe they don't spend too much time thinking about what is the outcome of having selected that arc, okay? All right, great. What do we do with this information? Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to use this learned clusters and the rules associated with the clusters to classify a new, a new student based on behaviors as they happen, okay, in one of these clusters, so as high learner or low learner. And then we're going to use the behaviors that are detected as being representative of a student belonging to a certain cluster to generate hints for the student that counteract the behaviors when they're known to be detrimental, okay? So user classification. So essentially from behavior discovery, we build we have the clusters, we have the rules, so we can build an online classifier that as a new user approaches the system and starts working with the system, the interaction data is collected, the vector is incrementally built to change those statistic, those measures that I, I was indicating earlier, um, and at any given point, the user is classified as belonging to one of the clusters, in this case we have only two, okay? Um, and because belonging to a cluster also comes with saying what are the behaviors that made the classification happen, if at any given point, for instance, a user is classified as being a low learner, and the rule that's triggered that classification is that he was using direct or click infrequently, then one thing that could be done is try to prompt that action more, okay? Or if the user was classified as a low learner and discovered to be a user that doesn't pause enough when doing direct or click, 
the system could try to say, you know, great that you're doing our direct our click, could try to think a little bit more about the outcome of that action. Okay? Um, so what we did, we did an evaluation to see if this classifier actually is any good in capturing whether students are learning or not with the simulation. So with our data set, we essentially did a, 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 a leave one a simulation um, and evaluation using the data set that we have. Or at any given point, we remove one student from the group. We learn the model on the other 63 students, and then we use the data from the, new, from the left one out participant as if it was a new student. We feed the data to the model and incrementally we look at what happens to the classification of the user for which we know the ground truth because we know if it's a high learner or a low learner. Okay, so these are the results. This is accuracy over time. So what happens after the system sees 10% of the actions or I don't know what the numbers are so wacky, but you know, 19, 30, 40 percent of the actions and so on and so forth. As you can see, accuracy obviously improves. This is uh, compared to a baseline that always predicts the most likely classifier. In this case, was low learners. Okay, uh, and so this is uh, it gets the classification is about 70 percent accurate for the baseline, and we can see that after about 28 percent of actions observed, the classifier built on the clusters and the rules starts beating the baseline. The difference is statistically significant and both classification of low learners and high learners is higher than the baseline. Okay? And after about 50% of the action, both classification of high learners and low learners go up, goes above 80% that for user modeling is pretty good. Okay? So, um, it looks like there is something good in this uh, method for classifying learners. What do we do with it? Okay, we said that once we know that someone is maybe not learning that well with the system, we want to do, we want the system to do something to direct them towards better usage behaviors that are more constructive in working with the simulation. By, however, maintaining, while well, maintaining their sense of uh, independence and initiative. Okay? So, um, there is a part of the system that essentially at some point, at this point, we have a classifier user model that gives a classification of the user, gives a label, high learner, low learner, and some of the behaviors that pertain to this particular classification of this user. These are, from the data set that I showed you earlier, these are the behaviors, from these behaviors, we can translate these behaviors into interventions. The behaviors that are associated with low learners, we want to discourage. The behaviors that have been mined from the clusters associated to high learners, we want to encourage. Okay? So I'm not going to go through all these guys, but these are nine different prompts that we have extracted from the rules that were built, that were extracted from the high learner and low learner uh, clusters, okay? So two are the ones that I showed you earlier. There was something that re 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 related, for instance, to low learners resetting too frequently, it's essentially trying and forgetting about what they've done so far and resetting in a way that is not very principled, and so on and so forth. Um, so from these behaviors, at any given point, the system checks what are the active behaviors that have been identified and pertaining to the specific user that is being classified. We have a measure to rank the different hints that are relevant to that specific learner at the specific point in time. I cannot go into the details, but they are in the paper here. Um, so at any given point, it, there is a hint that is considered as most important at that point in time. And that is selected as to be given to the user, okay? So for instance, if we have, as we said earlier, this user, low learner classified as not using direct or click enough, then we want to generate a hint, the system generates a hint that says, did you know you can tell AC3 which arc to make consistent by clicking on that arc, okay? Then, of course, we're gonna make, we wanted to make this hint not too forceful. We don't want to make the user, to force the user to follow the hint because that would defeat the idea of giving them still the freedom to explore and do what they actually want, okay? However, we also want to make sure that 
if they don't want to follow their hands, we give them another chance. Okay? So if the student continues working and the model says, okay, the hand that I gave earlier is still relevant because they, are, they haven't adjusted their behaviors accordingly, they give a second level hand that is a little bit more forceful and says, as I suggested earlier, you can choose which arc to make consistent next by clicking on it. Okay? Uh, this way you can get more involved in applying the AC3 algorithm. I have highlighted the relevant arcs for you. So it gives more guidance by highlighting things that could help the student follow the suggestion. Okay? I'm just going to quickly show you. Oops. So it took a while to find a way for students to, so as you've seen, the, stu the, the hint ge was generated somewhere in the middle and moved to the top, okay? This is in the interest of making the hands visible, but not too intrusive. You could have left them in the middle, but you don't want to do that because then the student wouldn't be able to continue and ignore the hint if they want to, okay? But if we just made the hint pop up in this corner, we noticed with previous studies using eye tracker, students were not looking at the hand. Often they couldn't even see that there was one, okay? So we found the movement attracts the attention. Students look at the hands more with this particular affordance that we designed. And um, what happened? Okay, another one came up, came up as I was talking. Um, and so this is the version that we tested. So we have an adaptive version of the CSP applet that leverages the mechanisms that I discussed. We ran a control study with 18 uh, students using and studying three CSP problems with the adaptive version of the CSP applet and 18 users studying the problems with the original version with no adaptive support. It was a similar design as one that I mentioned earlier. The Participants studied, again, material on the AC3 algorithm, took a pretest, worked with the problems or with the examples and the CSP applet, one of the two versions, and then took a post-test. Um, so these are like the summary of the results. So we have results showing that students working with the adaptive CSP applet learned significantly more. The, statistically, the difference is statistically significant. Um, and even more interesting, the students that learned the most were the students with the lowest pretest score. Okay? So, in the adaptive condition, the highest, the students with low pretest learned more compared to students with low pretest in the control condition. So, it looks, it seems like this adaptive support works for students who need the most because they are, they have lower lower knowledge to start with, okay, which is along the lines of what Stone was saying yesterday. Um, and also, are they actually improving because they're following the hints? Because otherwise, that's what we want. We want the hints to be successful in the sense that they make students take, uh, adopt the behaviors that the system think are useful. And here, in fact, we see that in terms of whether they were following what the user, the system was uh, encouraging to do, we have for level one, about 63% of the hints were followed during this particular study. So again, level one wasn't always very successful, but with level two, the um, percentage of followed hints went up to 73%, a little bit more than that. Okay, so this is quite encouraging. And again, not all the hints were, were useful because the model is not 100% correct, right? So it's, it's okay that students decide not to follow some of them, but this is a pretty good uh, follow-up rate. So we're very happy with it. Um, since I have a little bit of time, I want to show you. So we were quite happy with these results and wanted to see if this approach could work for a different type of simulation, okay? because otherwise it might have been just, you know, chance. So we actually decided to try and apply to one of these FET simulations from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, it's a phys simulation for physics in particular to help students understand uh, electrical circuits. Um, and it's called uh, DC Circuit Construction Kit. I never remember the name because it's not very intuitive, but CCK, okay? 
And essentially what this simulation does allow students to have different components for building electrical circuits and students can experiment with putting them together and they have immediate feedback on how the, what that does to the current in the circuit because they see, for instance, these little dots are electrons and depending on what they have in the circuit, they, they circulate, they move faster or more slowly. Uh, they can put lights and the current and the brightness of the light can change as a result of how they build the circuit, okay? Let's just see very quick. Uh, so this is a, a fast motion uh, example of what they can do. They can just grab components from here, see what happens to the electrons and then change. They can take measurements to look at the voltage, the amperes, and so on and so forth, okay? So different simulation. Um, one thing that it's different from the CSP applet, this is a more complex interaction. If you remember with the CSP applet, we had the seven actions, right? Like one level, we didn't need to go into any more formal representation or complicated representation of, the, of these actions. But here, we really have a very large variety of ways to interact with the simulation. So we have 25 actions, uh, for instance, uh, they can, uh, on the circuits, they can add, move, remove, and join a variety of components, okay? They can take measurements, they can take uh, voltage and current measurements, and they have also have things that they can do on the interface, change some of the parameters. Um, and these actions can be applied to 22 different components, including basic circuit elements, like here, the lights, the actual the resistors, and so on, so batteries. Um, and they have a variety of tools that they can use to measure current. And they can have different outcomes. So even the same action can have different outcomes on different elements of the circuit. Okay, so it's a much more complex uh, um, setup that they can deal with. Um, I'm just gonna sk skip this. It was, you know, what we had to do to deal with this complexity. We can talk about it if you have questions, uh, if there is, there is time at the end. But essentially, we wanna see how this framework applied to that simulation works. So we need to do exactly what we did before. We need to do, you know, collect data from students and then uh, do the clustering, association rule mining and classification, build the model and see if we can also extract behaviors that we can turn into hints. So, we ran another study where we had this time 96 uh, first year physics students. Um, these students were given a rather general goal to work with the simulation. So explore how resistors affect the behaviors of circuits by exploring different combinations of resistors and resistances, okay? Uh, they worked for about 25 minutes with the system collected about uh, 1,000 actions per student, and we collected, as before, pre and post test data. So we did, as before, from this data, we created vectors that represent frequency of usage of, of actions and uh, similar, as before, pauses, um, average of uh, pause time and standard deviation. So applying clustering to this data set generated the same results. We had two clusters with, again, in the um, differences that are statistically significant in how well students learn from pre-test to post-test in these two clusters, okay? So these are the clusters. Um, and it's always two clusters and I wish it was more because I think there is potential to find, for instance, clusters of low learners that are low learners for different reasons, like, or high learners that are high learners for different reasons. I just don't think we have enough data. You've seen the numbers. I mean, it's, they're not like crazy numbers, right? So I, there is not enough power, I think, for clustering to go into finer uh, grain clusters. But already like this is quite interesting. Uh, so from these clusters, we can build the classifiers as we did before. And uh, if we test the accuracy over time based on cross-validation, try to feed information from the user incrementally, we see that even here we have pretty good results where after the model starts beating the baseline, that is the majority classifier, after seeing about 30% of the data, and the accuracy still stays above, you know, close to 75% or higher, which is again quite, uh, quite good. 
And in terms of association rule mining, what we extracted, again, I cannot go to details because things are a little bit more complex than with the CSP applet, but when we did association rule mining, we found 15 behavior or patterns of behavior that can, if you look at them, can intuitively be associated with learning. Um, that is, we found that is in this simulation, it is productive, it is associated with the high learner clusters to test frequently, to take measurements, uh, frequently change resistance of resistors because that obviously it changes the setup and it allows you to understand how current uh, is affected by these changes. Pause again, this is come, you know, comes as you know, it was before, pause in between actions so that you can reflect on what the simulation is giving you and limit usage of things such as light bulbs and changing the intensity of light bulbs because light bulbs can act as resist resistors but they are, some of the physics professors we talked to, they said that they can be distracting. Students were playing. So the low learners tended to put a lot of these light bulbs because they liked seeing things, you know, shining and going up. But they were not really paying attention, okay? So this is one of the things that you might not necessarily a priori, a priori guess, but it's something that the data mining discovered. Um, do I have uh, five minutes? Okay, so I'm right to quickly, since I have five minutes. So we have seen that this um, approach works. You know, we have some interesting evidence and positive results by using actions only. What happens if we add something else? Okay. So, for instance, if we add gaze data. So yesterday, you know, uh, you know, already we had we heard a few talks of people interested in looking at different kinds of. Uh, sources of behavior and you know Roger talked about gaze data we use gaze data as well so in addition to actions we collected information on gaze data we did this just for the CSP applets so we're going back to the first simulation that I discussed um, so we ran another study with the CSP applets similar to the previous one where we had 45 subjects and as they were working with the system they were, their gaze was tracked using a Toby T120 eye tracker that is non-intrusive. As you can see, this person is, the gaze is tracked, but he's not wearing anything. So from the point of view of not wanting to put things on the subject, this is pretty good, okay? And uh, simply, okay, let me just see. Oh my gosh. So this is just an example of the gaze being tracked. So these this red dots are the fixations and the longer, the larger the dot means the person is looking more, okay? When we take this data, so essentially what we do, we look at these fixations, right? There are two things that you wanna look at when you look at eye tracking data, fixations and also saccades, that is essentially the transition from one fixation to the next. And there are some general measures that people have been looking at and you can use in your data mining, such as number of fixations, fixation rate, the duration of a fixation, saccade, length of the saccades, um, angles between saccades. And you can take measures uh, that are related, for instance, to average, standard deviation, and so on and so forth. You can also look, these are general measures. You can say, you know, over the course of this interaction, how many fixations the person had, what was the fixation rate, and so on and so forth. You might also want to look at attention to specific areas, okay? So you can look at areas of interest where you can look at, uh, in this case, what's relevant is this panel at the top where the actions can be initiated, the graph itself, some of the message panels that explain to the student what's going on with the algorithm. Oops. And so you might want to collect things such as proportional number of fixations within each of those areas, proportion of time spent, time to first fixation, and so on and so forth. So we have uh, tried to build classifiers, as I showed earlier, by using only the 21 action-based features that we discussed previously. We also try just using gaze data, where we have about 51 features after a few that were removed because they were highly correlated. Then we also try to combine fuse, gaze, and action to see you know, where, that, where does that take us. And um, 
So average over time accuracy. So you can see here that action plus I has slightly higher accuracy, but is not in itself that much better than action only. However, if you look at the accuracy at, pre at predicting each individual class, high learners and low learners, you see that the action plus I is a much better balanced classifier. So gaze help in that respect, okay? And in fact, if we do that accuracy over time, as we were looking at earlier, if we use this action plus gaze classifier, achieves 80% classification accuracy after seeing about 22% of the interaction, which means, really, you can start giving this feedback fairly early on. The system does need to learn a little bit about the user, so you cannot start giving feedback immediately, as to be expected, right? The tutor, a human tutor, would have to do the same. See what the student is doing, and as soon as you can, provide some help, okay? And here we see where we can do it early enough. All right, so this was my last uh, piece. Um, so in general, what we want to conclude is that you know, we've presented a user modeling framework that is designed to provide personalized support to learning with interactive simulations. Uh, the key point is that the relevant behaviors were discovered via data mining. Uh, and we have very encouraging results with one simulation, the CSP applet. So we're able to identify clusters that represent students that learn in different ways and at different levels with the applet. We use these clusters to build online classifiers of, of learners that can, in real time, with a relatively good accuracy, capture whether a learner is doing its learning well or not with the simulation. And we can also generate from this data mining process adaptive interventions that have uh, been shown to be successful in eliciting learner when compared to the non-adaptive version, okay? And we have also shown that we have evidence that the approach can transfer to a very different simulation that is more complex. We have done the evaluation only up to the level of can we actually model, the mo are the models accurate? And gaze data can help. So looking at more sources of information, it seems to be useful, okay? And just in terms of future work, so first of all, what we want to do is try to build the adaptive interventions for the physics CCK simulation, as we did for the CSP applet, to see if we can reproduce the effective, um, the, the results, the positive results that we had for the CSP applet. Um, obviously, we want to try to apply the approach to other simulations. So if anybody has a simulation, and you want us to try our approach on your simulation. If you're running a study, you're collecting data, you know, let us know if you want to collaborate because we want to try with different systems. Um, and if it's not a simulation, even if it's an educational game, but anything where it's important and you might not want to know, you, you might not be able to know a priori what you want to model. You want to discover what's going on with your students. You know, we would be happy to try and see how our approach works with your data. And this is my really, you know, that's the key that I, I'm really interesting to, interested in seeing how does this approach, which is in the end very superficial, the modeling is so superficial. The modeling just says clusters of people that behave different with the system, very superficial behaviors, no connection between these behaviors and knowledge and understanding, nothing, okay? More superficial than this, hard to get, okay? So my title at the beginning was also like cheating because I said representation and reasoning. There's not much reasoning, really, okay? It's the data mining generates these behaviors and, uh, and, and we take those and we present them to the student. We try to give a little bit of a justification that, you know, it's intuitive, but there is no deep representation in the, of the model, of the domain, nothing, okay? But you could try. I would love to try and see how much better we could do if we had deeper models as I did with a different simulation as I was mentioning earlier. So this is something that to me is very interesting, right? Uh, how far can you go with having this superficial data-based approach that seems to be working at some level, but in terms of the explanation that I was asking um, Roger about yesterday, why, you know, how do you explain to the student why you're suggesting this behavior? You can't, because it's just the result of the data mining. It's like, well, all you can say is my, 
whatever clustering algorithm you're using generated, right? Uh, so it's really hard to generate good explanations. So, but if the users trust the system and follow the suggestions and they seem to work better, that's already an achievement. So, okay, so this is the end. Oh, no, I have to thank you, the people who helped me with this work, and you for your kind attention. <laughs>